Okay. Okay, I think we're on. Hello everyone and welcome to Working In With Heights, potentially the only series that's dedicated to exercising your brain. So give your muscles a break for an hour and get ready to stretch your synapses instead. Now we believe a healthy brain is the key to a healthy, happier life. So we created this idea of a cranium gymnasium to help people take the time to nourish their brains as well as their bodies. Each week, we're gonna have a different mental fitness instructor, all the different specialities to keep things fresh and exciting. The aim for the next hour is to deliver as much actionable, useful information as possible. So even if you only learn one thing, you can put it into practice straight away and start seeing results or gains, if you will. Now, Heights, as you might have guessed, or you probably know by now, is all about brain health and mental well-being. We make smart, sustainable supplements that combine essential oils and nutrients that your brain and body need and deliver them to your doorstep every month. And we also create clever content in collaboration with world-leading experts to help you optimize your brain's health and performance too, so you can reach your heights, whatever they might be. So that's enough about us. It's time to get started. A bit of our weekly housekeeping. We've got our moderator in the chat, the amazing community manager, Emma. So if you've got any questions, please post them in there so she can send them over to me and we'll get them answered in between. Now, if learning about your brain from the world's leading expert sounds good to you, please start the session by hitting subscribe right now and we will continue to deliver your regular scheduled neurological nourishment every week. We've also got the brilliant Natalia Talkowska, who is doing live illustrations of our sessions to share on social, which means that Gina, you're gonna have a very cool personalized illustration about everything Excellent. that we speak about today <laughs> ready for you. Okay, so enough from us. It's time to introduce this week's guest. We're very excited to have Gina Rippon. She's going to cover three topics on the gendered brain today. The first is the history of the question of the gendered brain and contemporary neurotrash and neurosexism around it. Um, secondly, if there are gender differences at all, where do they come from? And finally, what do gender differences or assumptions mean for brain owners like you, me, and Gina? Okay, so first, Gina, if you could please start by just giving us a short summary of your career to date um, and give us some context behind your own brilliant mind to set the scene, please. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll draw a veil over the brilliant mind comment. Um, thank you very much for asking me and, um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, career to date, I quite a long career to date. I started as a psychologist. I was originally going to train as a medic. And then for various reasons, um, which actually are quite significant in terms of what I landed up researching, um, I went to a school, which um, a girls school, which didn't do science. Um, so it was then quite hard for me to get into medical school. So I, I went off to do psychology. Um, I was always been interested in the brain. So I think um, at the back of my mind was whatever I did, it had to be something to do with understanding the brain. And I was lucky enough when I uh, did my undergraduate and my, my, my PhD, um, initially uh, in a psychology department, which had a big emphasis on biology. And then in my PhD, it was actually a, a, a neurophysiology and psychology department. So um, I was able to study the brain right from the beginning. And I've been really lucky with respect to that. I guess my career has, um, tied in with all of those sort of interests. And my PhD was actually on schizophrenia. So I've always been very interested in, in mental illness and how understanding the brain could help us understand that. Uh, when I finished my PhD, I went to the then very new Department of Psychology at the University of Warwick. In fact, I and three other colleagues arrived the day before the students. Uh, the first student uh, uh, single honours intake. So that was quite exciting. <laughs> um, so the first kind of probably four or five years of my career was a whirlwind of making sure I got a lecture written the day before the students were due to have it. So managed to set up a new lab um, just about the time that um, more innovative means of brain imaging were coming in. Um, stayed at Warwick actually for 25 years. And then in 2000, I moved to the Aston, to Aston University. They just acquired a, a fantastic new system. It's the only one in the UK at the time, which was a very um, a, a, a new a breakthrough in terms of understanding brain imaging. Uh, and that's where I've been ever since. So I haven't moved around an awful lot, but I've done quite a lot of different things, studied different types of behavior, typical and atypical, um, in my quest to 
see what the brain can do. Well, I think this is the perfect. Ooh, I think this is the perfect setup for um, ultimately what we're expecting from this first work in, which is really all about history. So you've given us your own history. Um, now, why don't you take us through, uh, you know, a short history of the gendered brain concept? Like, okay. where did that even stem from? Okay. Um, well, probably at this point, ought to draw attention to the fact that there is a difference between the term sex and the term gender. Um, and certainly where this started, which was slightly further back than, than my career, at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, uh, you just talked about sex in terms of biological sex. And at that point, it's when we were starting to understand that the brain uh, was really the control center of, of human behavior. And the researchers at that point believed very strongly that biological sex uh, determined uh, particular brain characteristics, et cetera. And the belief that your biological sex determined your role in life, which we would now call gender, but they didn't really have a word for it then, it was very powerful. So there was just a single term sex. Um, fast forward to the sort of 1980s when there was a, a, a second wave of feminism, which was, was uh, very much focused on the idea that there was some kind of societal control over who could do what. And that's when the term gender came in because there was the idea that there were um, roles which were differentiated by the sex of the people who did them. And that was called uh, gender. And it's a bit like the, the nature versus nurture idea, which is, is, is um, hopefully we might touch on later a bit past its sell by date. Um, and then we fast forward to, the, to this century when we're, we're talking more about how entangled sex and, 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 and gender are as concepts. So, Sorry, that's a very long preamble to your question about but an important, uh, an important uh, distinction about the history. Yes, so right at the beginning, it was the idea that whatever it was, they bodies, um, and at that point, they didn't know, but they were clearly aware that men and women had different bodies. Whatever it was, made their bodies different, also made their brains different. Um, so that was one starting point. The other starting point was actually a kind of justification of what they were doing. So. They looked at society and they looked at brain science and they said for brain science to have credibility, it needs to be able to explain how people live their lives, what people see in the world around them. And one thing they see is that men and women are different. Um, and uh, particularly at the beginning of this uh, hunt, what I call the hunt, the difference agenda, they saw that women were inferior. So they looked at society, they looked at um, financial standing, political power, um, your property owning anything and they said well women are inferior so we as brain scientists need to try and understand what it is that makes women's brains inferior we need to come up with some kind of measure which can prove that this is why women um, you know shouldn't be educated shouldn't be given political power or financial independence etc so so that was really the the starting point so they were working backwards from the status quo if you like saying men and women are different so let's find out why so that's when you start to get uh, very strange ways of bearing in mind that all of the theories that actually emerged at the time and really if we look carefully still inform a lot of what we think about uh, the brain today they arose at a time when we couldn't study the brain um, you could take a skull and fill it with bird seed and weigh it and say there must have been quite a big brain went in that skull or here's a a, a miniature brain uh, which must have gone in this skull etc um, you could look at the consequences of forms of brain damage and understanding that had been around since the, the, the kind of times of, 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 of Greek uh, medicine etc um, or you could guess that there was some kind of disease which is affecting some people's behavior but you couldn't look at the brain but you know that didn't stop the early scientists they were going to come up with these great measures so we had phrenology which felt bumps on the skull. We had craniology, which um, had a whole set of really weird measures looking at the um, relationship between the angle of your forehead and the angle of your jaw or your left lobe and the tip of your chin, et cetera. Um, got up to about 5,000 different measures. And that, they said, allowed them to uh, draw conclusions about the, uh, the structures of the brain or, or what the brain was like in, inside, the, inside the head. Um, but this, the uh, measure of success of these metrics was that they proved that at the top of any scale they came up with was white, because it definitely intersected with the kind of whole race science issue, male, 
educated upper class um, individuals. And if a measure didn't come up with that as that kind of person as the winner, then the metric was um, uh, uh, rejected. Clearly something wrong with the metric if it came up with a measure that, that looked as though women were better at something. Um, so that was very much the beginning. Uh, and there's some wonderful quotes um, very early on about, um, you know, women, uh, bright women were so rare, they were like the, um, as rare as a, a two-headed gorilla, for example. So there was a very clear belief at the time. That's not okay, one of yours, by, is it? Sorry? That's not one of yours, is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> but echoed by, I'm afraid, one of the greatest scientists of all time, Charles Darwin, who was very much of the belief that women were inferior, lower down the evolutionary scale. Um, and, you know, he echoed very much the, the thinking of the time, which is what, 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 what was really true of, of brain science and how it emerged. And Moving is this even through... with evidence to the contrary even then? Sorry? And this is with evidence to the contrary even at that point? Even at that point. Um, but so then even, there was... even Darwin's not impervious to cognitive dissonance, for example? Yes, that's right, yes. Or there was also, um, it was interesting tracking how it was proved that, that men were in, were, were, had superior brains. So at one point there was um, what we now still believe is that the frontal lobes, the front part of the brain are very important for key, um, uh, key skills. And there was lots of papers showing how men had bigger frontal lobes. And then there was a fashion for a different part of the brain, parietal lobes, which deals with uh, spatial processing, visual spatial processing. And there was a worrying uh, output of data suggesting women had bigger parietal lobes um, and therefore that would suggest that they were superior so there was a nice kind of uh, rewriting of you know a bit like we're looking at nowadays retraction of papers saying where they thought that homo frontalis was actually superior now they were thinking that homo parietalis should actually be acknowledged as the head of the uh, uh, of any kind of evolutionary scale and then that that uh, pattern reversed so um yes there was there was uh, a very clear aim that you should prove the answer that you'd already settled on. And I suppose not a lot of, and I suppose not a lot of incentive uh, for people to to change the status quo, right? Which is a very common problem in in science, and ironically for Darwin, even evolution. Yes, well, that's right. I mean, because uh, the people in power were the people in power. The scientists were males. Um, you did shift slightly from the kind of inferiority claim to complementarity. So they started saying, yes, women's brains were different and they gave them different skills, but the skills they gave them were things like uh, intuition um, and emotion uh, understanding. Um, and they were on, the, uh, on, on a par with uh, animals. Uh, so yes, women had particular skills which made them good at certain things, usually again in quotes, um, being womanly companions and good wives and mothers, etc. So there was still a move that there was a kind of useful set of skills that this particular set of individuals could have. And luckily, they had a brain which gave them those. Um, and of course, behind all of this, which we might get onto later, was if something's biological, you know, your brain is determined by your biology, that's, you know, regretfully, as you may, <laughs> inconvenient truth is another phrase which comes up again, it's something that you might think, well, actually, um, much as we might like some kind of equality and diversity, people's brains just don't fit that kind of agenda. And, and this is this is kind of the uh, um, neuro trash and, uh, you know, neuro sexism that you talk about, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's slightly different in that, um, well, neuro trash and neuro sexism, I use them in two different ways. Um, and that, that brings us right into the beginning of the this century, the end of the last century, when brain imaging emerged. And we started to get these wonderfully, um, and the term is used a lot, seductive images, which really made us think at last, we can look at intact living human brains in intact living humans. We will understand how they get to do what they do. And you get these lovely color coded uh, images, which, which are very compelling, always used on the, you know, um, in Sunday supplements, popular science. Neurotrash authors, the ones I call neurotrash, were individuals who were very much in the kind of self-help guru um, market. Uh, and they uh, had been pushing this idea that men and women 
brought different things to relationships, for example, the, the basis of the, what I call the granddaddy of all the neuro trash books, uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And so it was great when you got these wonderful pictures, which appeared to show, oh, look, you know, a woman's brain lights up on both sides when she's using language and a man only on one side. A woman's brain lights up all over when she um, hears a baby crying and a, a man doesn't show any change at all. So it, it was, again, compelling use of uh, this kind of evidence to, to tell a particular story. So that would be the neuro trash where ill-advised uh, authors misrepresented what goes on. Um, neurosexism has a slightly different meaning in, in how it's currently used. It was a term coined by Cordelia Fine, where she's looking with some anxiety, as I do, at uh, today's neuroscience research and says there is still a very powerful punt the difference agenda informing the questions that people are asking, informing what they publish, informing how they interpret their data, etc. cetera. Um, which the, it, the term neurosexism is really saying this is research which is um, maintaining, sustaining the stereotypes um, uh, which, we, which we feel uh, uh, do not, um, are not represented by the science, I think is the best way of saying it. Understood. Um, before I go to, uh, to questions from people, um, I guess I'd like to know what you think the main opportunity for us is in understanding the gendered brain from a neuroimaging perspective. So other than obviously trying to force people against cognitive dissonance and just looking at facts, um, but people can obviously be quite stubborn even with facts and hold on to their beliefs. Um, I'm wondering what, what, what else you think might be the, the opportunities in turning some of those opinions around? I think the key thing is a um, very compelling image of how tiny the differences actually are. Um, because at some point we need to, I need to establish, maybe now, I'm not a sex difference denier. I do think that there are differences in the brain, um, but they are generally very tiny. Uh, whereas uh, the variability within groups of men and groups of women is huge. And I think that's really important to understand how variable the brain is. And in fact, um, the origin of, of the book that I've written called The Gendered Brain um, was really because I was interested in how individual brains are different, why, why everybody's brain is so different from everybody else's. And that's, that's why I wanted to call it Fifty Shades of Brain Matter at some point. But they got to what happened? <laughs> well, the publishers felt it lacked gravitas, I think. Oh, and, uh... What a shame. That's a terrible <laughs> exactly. decision. Exactly. Yes, uh... Uh, that's right. So I think, well, I think they hoped that the, the, the book might outlast the um, the, the understanding phenomenon. of what the Fifty Shades of Grey il illusion was was meant to be. But I, I think the key issue is to bear in mind that everybody's brain is different from everybody else's. I'm not trying to say men's and women's brains are the same. Uh, I'm saying they are different and it's, it's understanding how they get to be different, which is what 21st century neuroscience has really brought us. Okay, so some quick questions from our audience. We're going to start off uh, with how much do words influence gender expression within children? Um, gender expression, uh, you mean whether or not uh, children are identifying themselves as male or female? Yeah, I'm guessing um, so. Yeah, I, th I think very much. I, I think language matters a lot in, in, in this whole area. Um, I mean, when people talk about male or female brains, you know, they talk about the female brain or the male brain, um, opening lines of, of, of a particular book, which I have talked about. Uh, and then later on, the, the author of the book says, of course, you don't have to be a man to have a male brain. And you think, actually, I think that's a fairly fundamental point that should have been made really early on. So that's talking to adults. I think for children, yes, it's very powerful. I mean, if you're if a, a little girl is, is always praised for being pretty, um, a little boy is always praised for being brave, um, then they pick up on that because children are, are very astute gender detectives. Um, it's, it's, it's what their brains are for when they're developing. It's, you know, who am I? Where do I fit into this social world? Who, who's my in-group? Who's my out-group? So the words that are used are, are very, very important. And particularly if they're attached to particular images in, in children's books or what's written on their t-shirts, for example. Um, 
Okay, so I mean, a lot of these questions, um, again, so we've got one regarding children. So um, a question from uh, Fix Seizure. I'm sorry, I definitely didn't pronounce your name correctly. Um, but I remember reading that in countries where languages don't have gendered pronouns, such as Finnish, children develop gender identity much later. Is that true? Um, yes, I mean, I think there is, and particularly the evidence is that gender stereotyping or um, self-stereotyping is less powerful in those languages which are not gendered, um, like, like French, for example, you know, um, and, and I think that I'd love to pursue that at the neuroimaging level. I haven't seen any neuroscience work done on that. But yes, I mean, if your society flags up gender as being important to the extent that, you know, that nouns in your language have different genders, then clearly there is something in your head, your social brain, which says this is an important distinction. So Jules wants to know, um, are there any ingrained biases on gender differences still around today that date back to the pre-brain imaging times, phrenology, etc.? <laughs> there's still, um, yes, I mean, there's still, I've, I've still come across books about right-left brain differences. Um, so there's, you know, when starting to understand the brain emerged, there was a quite a powerful movement, which really was a, a decade or more, certainly if you look at books published in the time, what, that, that your, the right-hand side of your brain did something different from the left-hand side. And that was also tied in with, with being male or female. So that's, that's still around. Um, and in fact, informed very early brain imaging research. Um, yeah, yeah, that one that one particularly upsets uh, Tara, our chief science officer. She's very, uh, very irritated. People still have the, the left brain, right the, brain. The right brain approach to, yeah, whatever. Yes. Exactly. Um, a quite, I mean, a very relevant question then from Carlos, which is why is there still such a strong school of thought about the male and female brain if the science is so definitive? What would you say <laughs> to those people? Gosh, um, well, about four hundred. if I could read out 425 pages of my book or whatever. Um, I think it's because it's a very powerful, because we're born to be social, our society flags up in groups and out groups. And one of the most powerful messages we get from the moment of birth, and in fact, if you include gender reveal parties, which I rant about in the book, even earlier than that, um, our society flags that up as very important. So if somebody comes along and says, well, you do realize that there are huge gender gaps in the world. This is something we have to acknowledge. There's been very powerful efforts to overcome those gender gaps. And in some cases they've succeeded, in some cases they haven't. Um, and people will look around and, and they, you know, there is a confirmation bias. Uh, somebody will say to me, uh, everybody in my office, you know, all the women in my office are really emotional. So that's, you know, men and women are clearly different. And then you say, well, you know, here's the 10 women in your office. Is this one always more emotional than all of these other people? other males so when you start you know it, it is very well embedded as I say right from the moment of birth um, that men, men and women are different so I think it's very difficult to overcome that and there are sex differences in the brain again you know people will say um, it's, it's almost a kind of gotcha in neuroscience if people think that there's people like me and Cordelia Fine they say you're a sex difference denier so the next time the paper comes out saying sex differences in the amygdala have been found. They always send you a copy triumphantly saying, you know, right, there you are, you've been wrong all along. And you say, actually, it doesn't worry me at all. And in fact, I think you'll find it interesting that the next paper that comes out says there aren't any sex differences in the amygdala, but there's sex differences in something else. But there's a whole whole other argument. It's something which is very important to people um, and, and should be. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, um, th this is all old fashioned two headed gorilla speak. <laughs> um, but I think the key thing is trying to avoid people thinking that all men are like this and all men are like that, or all boys are like this and all girls are like that, particularly when they've got input into education policy, for example. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, for concluding that first uh, first work, and we can go straight into the second. So this work is all about how the world around you makes up your brain. I'm guessing that really is, is a question of you know neuroplasticity and choices. Um, mm. So, Gina, what does it what does it all mean in essence? Well, how does the world around you make up your brain? Okay, well, I think um, I, I guess that's really why why I wrote the book because I thought in the 21st century, there have been some amazing breakthroughs in understanding the brain. Um, 
and these should impact on this question and a lot of the time they don't so I guess this is this is where the book came from it's what I call the three p's so the idea is that our, our work our, our brain works like a, a prediction engine um, or like a predictive texture so we've always thought of the brain as an amazing information processing system which it is but we thought it as fairly reactive the the information arrives and the brain deals with it and we learn and 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 you know understand the world etc but what we now know is the world the brain is actually uh, gathering information all the time and making predictions so it's it's not accurately processing all the information it's saying when you see this this is what's most likely to happen so we don't need to do any more processing we'll move on um, and this can be right at the basis of, 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 of uh, sensation, sens sensory systems. So we get things like visual illusions where you see a, a triangle which isn't there, but the brain has said, when you see this configuration of shapes, it usually means there's a triangle. So let's call it a triangle and move on. Um, so that's the first P, the fact that our brain is out there in the world gathering information. And that information is used to generate algorithms, if you like, the kind of algorithms the brain will need to drive us successfully through the world. Um, so that's the first P. The second P is, is plasticity, which you always mentioned, because we knew the brain was fairly plastic when it was developing and that, that um, dramatic in incidents in a, in a developing brain's um, trajectory could change that brain um, and cause uh, uh, quite dramatic problems. But we now know that uh, even at a, a sort of very um, fundamental level, not pathological, our brain is changing all the time, even when we're adults, because the whole idea of this essentialist pathway, this kind of biology is destiny pathway, was that our brain reached a developmental endpoint when it stopped growing. And that was the brain we had, which carried us through the world, and which meant that, you know, our place in the world was determined by this brain. But now we know that the brain will change depending on the experiences we have, you know, learning to uh, drive a black cab in London or to play a musical instrument or to juggle or a, a whole range of things we can now see at the brain level. So if, if your brain, if you, the owner of the brain has particular experiences, that brain will change. If the owner of the brain doesn't have those experiences, the brain will develop differently. And I always use that as an example to talk about um, spatial processing, the idea that men are, you know, the, the old men are better at map reading argument. Um, much That's why more men are scientists, because they've got this amazing spatial skill. But you can see it's a skill which emerges very early on, responds to the kind of toys and hobbies people have. Um, and therefore, if you aren't exposed to that kind of skill, that, that kind of training, you don't get the skill and and you know, therefore you get into self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's the second P, you have a plastic brain. And the third one is permeable. The idea is that because our brain is wired to make us social, he needs to understand the social rules, the social norms, the social context, the social expectations in which it is functioning. So it's not just receiving the information, it's saying, you know, what should, you know, if I see a face like this, what, what kind of emotion is it conveying? Is that a good thing or a bad thing for me? Um, or even, you know, somebody tells you this is a task that people like you are good at, or this is a task people like you are bad at, you can see that how people solve the problem, and the, the people who are given the negative message, unsurprisingly, make more mistakes, but you can also see that at the brain level. So we know our brain um, is really interacting much more with the outside world than we ever thought. The focus was always on how we, this biological script was unfolding within the brain, but now we need to realize it's kind of unfolding on a, on a social stage and that different people have different experiences and that's what changes their brain. So I guess whilst we like now we've understood how to diagnose that stuff, uh, what do you think about, you know, practical tips for staying in control of such changes? Well, I think the plasticity thing is, is key uh, in terms of education, because one of the things we also know is that this starts very, very early very early indeed. We used to think that babies, it was kind of patronizingly called them, you know, subcortical. We thought their frontal lobes were functionally silent. We know that babies are the most amazing information processors from very early on, and they pick up all sorts of clues from the environment. So being aware of that is very important in terms of, if you like, marketing, parenting. And how quickly do they pick those up? Can you give me a, like, a few <coughs> examples? 
Um, well, within um, within days, uh, a newborn baby can tell the difference between its native language and another language. It will respond almost from birth. It will respond differently to um, the sight of a human face as opposed to the sight of an image which has got the same components but which are scrambled. So little social cues is picking up very quickly. And within the first year, it's noticing differences. So if you show a baby a picture of a man putting on lipstick or a picture of a woman's face with a deep voice coming out of it, um, the baby will be surprised, you know, because it's this is not how its world is normally constructed. It hasn't at, at generally, as far as we know, attached um, a value to that difference, but it has noticed so very early on. So being aware of that, I think, is important. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I could carry on forever, but <laughs> people might want to ask oh, I mean, I guess, Yeah, that's, that's very fair. OK, um, so I guess you know, if there might be gender differences to be considered, then what do you think those things are going to be shaped by? Is it literally, uh, you know, how your friends and family talk to you or is there more to it? I think that's that's a very, uh, a very important point. And I think it's also important in terms of how we understand ourselves and that we need to be aware that that understanding starts very early, too. So, yes, I mean, there's a great phrase that Reshma Sojani, who founded Girls Who Code, said, we raise our boys to be brave and our girls to be perfect. And I just think that really sums up how the world treats children differently, how they're educated differently, they're praised for different things. Um, and there's a, a mountain of evidence showing that, you know, the different ways in which teachers praise girls as opposed to boys. Um, you know, anybody, and, and that is the key thing about this, everybody has their own experiences that they can bring to this argument. And I mean, this is obviously a, a, a complicated question, but, you know, speaking to an expert here, so um, in circumstances regarding gender reassignment or transgender brains, do you have any insights into whether the brain itself changes over the uh, its shape over that period? And um, do, do you have any um, uh, scans or information about what's going on in the before and after in that process? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a very important issue, and it's it's clearly uh, very timely, as it were, in terms of, of, of current uh, concerns about the, these kind of issues. Um, it almost comes back to this argument about sex and gender. Um, if you think that there is an, uh, and as it was uh, initially proposed, that there is an unbreakable link between somebody's biological sex and somebody's social gender, um, and for whatever reason, there feels like a disconnect between the sex you've been assigned at birth due to the appearance of your genitals, to be, to be um, blunt, um, and you know, you you check the list of this is what boys are like and this is what girls are like, and you think, you know, if you're a girl, none of the above. If if you believe powerfully that your biology is connected to this, then um, you could believe that you need to change the biology to make sure that this disconnect there isn't this disconnect. Um, so that's the kind of biological aspect and why people say um, some of the things that I say about if you know, it, it, a transgender person. Um, it, it is. It, it feels sometimes feels a bit trivial to present it in this way, but there is an argument where transgender individuals will say, "I feel I've got a female brain in a male body." That's their explanation of how they feel. If you, say, if somebody like me says, "Well, actually, there isn't such a thing as a female brain," so people will say, "Could you?" And I have had this a transgender man saying, "I really could you scan my brain to show that it's actually a female brain." So then I say, but there is no template for a female brain. There's, I can't show you an image and say, gosh, this is the image of your brain and it's much more like this one than it is of a, of a male brain. I would say that transgender brains will be different from uh, cisgender brains because if, like me, you believe the lives that people have lived um, is a, a profound influence on what their brains are like, transgender people will by definition have lived very different lives from cisgender people. Um, I think when you start talking about hormones, giving different hormones, yes, of course, the brain will change. I mean, that's, you know, in terms of like sex differences in the brain, we have different receptors in the brain determined by our genotype. So giving a different hormones will change the brain. That's, that's what hormones are for. A drive to action is the actual meaning of that. Um, what you make of all of that 
um, takes me way out of my comfort zone. Um, and I think you have to be very careful. I don't, I don't think there's any good research as yet done on this issue. I think it could be, but I think it would be much better done much more at the individual level and tied much more closely to individuals uh, self-stereotyping, their understanding of, of gender, et cetera. Okay, and be before we go to, uh, to questions from the audience, uh, I'd love to know what the most interesting uh, changes you've seen that are scanned in the brain are. You know, what were the what were the circumstances of that person's life or uh, or or plasticity, if you will? <laughs> um, well, I, I'm 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 still blown away by watching any brain <laughs> scan emerging. Actually, so so all of them are fascinating. Um, I think with respect, well, there's, there's two areas. I, I work in the, my, my data, as it were, is in, in the area of developmental disorders. So actually looking at children with developmental dyslexia, for example, um, and watching what happens when you um, give a, an otherwise bright, engaged, uh, talkative little boy um, a page of text to read, watching what happens to the brain then is 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 um, very informative, I think, um, and hopefully feeds into an understanding of, of that particular problem. Uh, with respect to autism, um, which is what I'm currently working on, uh, it's the variability within the population, which I find uh, most stunning. Um, there's a phrase in the autistic community, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And I think the same thing applies to the autistic brain. If you see one autistic brain, you've seen one autistic brain. Um, so huge amounts of, of, of variability, um, I think is in terms of my own research. I mean, there's all sorts of wonderful stories and fascinating things in neuroscience as a whole. Okay, we'll get to we'll get to some questions because there are a lot, so and we can't cover all of them. So, uh, first question from Jules: Is there a neural basis for prescriptive bias, e.g., likability penalty for women, and how can we fight against the social construct? Sorry, I th um, there was something after prescriptive. I missed that. What was the question? Sorry, is there sure is there a neural basis for prescriptive bias, like likability penalty for women, and how oh, might we fight against the social construct? Okay, gosh. Um, <laughs> I think being aware of it is one of the key things, actually. Uh, making unconscious biases conscious uh, has proved to be quite powerful. Um, it's interesting if you look at some of the research which is done on the evolution uh, in, in terms of watching how they uh, emerge in brains of things like stereotypes. Um, and they are stored, they appear to be stored in a, a, a different store. I don't like to get into arguments about localization. Um, uh, than just ordinary semantic memory. So, so stereotypes are stored very powerfully within our kind of social brain network. I think challenging them, um, counterexamples, um, you know, the kind of work that organizational psychologists do in, in, in challenging bias. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's just something which has to be ongoing. That's really a weak non-answer but <laughs> <laughs> okay um, well, I mean you can't have the answers you can't have the answers to everything that's okay that's why there's a whole a whole series of experts so um, <laughs> we'll move on to the next one in terms of immigration uh, people are exposed to different social structures so what do you think is the neural effect of that that's it that's a great question actually um, there's been some really interesting work looking at immigrants uh, newly arrived immigrants in into different cultures um, and showing how for example, face processing changes or their understanding of emotional expression changes. Um, and it does, which again is a you know, shout out for, for plasticity. Um, so I think it demonstrates uh, the importance of, if, if you want people to be integrated, then you need them to expose them to um, whatever is important in the culture that they uh, want to be integrated into. Okay, I mean, I've got a really, a really interesting question here. Um, can you tell the gender of the brain when a baby is born? Is it not the experiences they have that would have would shape their understanding slash change their brain development? That is a great question, and uh, it, you know, if we had the answer to that question, that might have sold lots and lots of stopped lots and lots of books being written. Um, 
No, uh, in terms is it, it, the short answer. Um, there have been lots of attempts, um, particularly imaging newborn babies, healthy newborn babies is a relatively new exercise. And um, in the last two or three years, there have been, or we've found sex differences in the brain in connections between the brains of baby boys and baby girls. They haven't stood up to the test of replicability as yet. So uh, you know, somebody couldn't show me an image of a newborn baby's brain, which is actually um, quite uh, uh, poorly formed. That sounds pejorative. Um, unformed, if you like. So it's actually quite, quite difficult to really pick out the key structures anyway. There are people who are working very intensively on looking at uh, different pathways, etc., and what's established before birth. None of them have come up with any sex differences. It's something I asked when I was writing the book. I go back to people and they either say the population was too small or we look for sex differences and didn't find any. And I always find that, question, that answer interesting because actually saying that would be almost more important than saying we did find differences. Um, so no, we can't tell the difference at the moment. Okay, and um, a great question from Vinu, which is, uh, autism is much more difficult to detect in females. Why, what is going on in their brains that is slower slash harder to detect? Okay, um, that is a great question because in fact, autism is a nice case study of how using a particular gendered lens has blinded us to the, the diversity of a population. Autism is always um, presented as a male problem uh, right from the beginning, in fact, it was always there was a much higher proportion of boys who were diagnosed as, as, as autistic than, than girls. It's now emerging that actually because of this belief that it's a boy problem, there are many women, girls and women, who've waited years and years, decades sometimes, before they actually got a diagnosis of autism. Because the diagnostic dice are loaded, is the phrase I use, because... The first expectation is that if you're a girl, you can't be autistic because it's a boy problem. Um, and you then get tied into all sorts of policy things like there's an 18 months to two year waiting list for autism assessment. So you go along to your GP or something and they'll say, oh, you can't be autistic in any way. There's no point because this is what the waiting list is like. So that's that's one answer to the question is, is there are autistic girls and they're not that hard to diagnose. It's just that we're not using the right diagnostic tools. There is an additional angle, which is really where I'm starting to work, where my two areas of interest are coming together, that maybe autism does present slightly different in girls. And the reason that girls are diagnosed later is that they have some kind of inbuilt ability to, and it's called camouflage or fly beneath the radar, um, until very often the onset of puberty or moving to secondary school, et cetera. So they kind of manage to hide the fact that the kind of behavior or hide the kind of behavior that get boys diagnosed as being autistic. So girls understand that they, they need to be part of a friendship group and they do that by watching what the groups do and copying them and, and having the same kind of repetitive behaviors that get boys get described as having, but they're, they're more socially uh, acceptable like collecting Barbie dolls or My Little Ponies or whatever the current thing is. Um, with respect to girls in autism, there's no, no good work done on younger autistic individuals. There is some work being done on adults, um, looking at females and males. Um, again, coming up with the idea that there's a huge overlap. Um, you know, so some autistic females look different to autistic males, but others look more similar to the autistic males than they do to control females. So. Um, Again, sorry, a non, a hand wavy, non exact answer, but it's a great question. And I, I think autism might is- Might be a, a future in politics for you, Gina. Sorry? Oh, right. So it might be a future in politics for I'm you. I'm giving a non answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll ask you, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one more from, from the crowd, um, which is uh, hopefully gonna get a, a clear answer then, which is what's your position on um, nutrition uh, and its impact on the, the gendered brain? On the gendered brain? Well, that was the question, but I think we mean by this point just the brain. Okay, yes. Um, well, I think nutrition certainly has a, a, an effect because our, you know, our brain is a biological organ and is fed by, um, uh, uh, by nutrition. Uh, and I think there's clear, clear evidence, particularly with respect to levels of 
of neurotransmitter and, and brain health, uh, et cetera, that nutrition um, can have an effect. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the context of the question. Um, so yes, I, I think nutrition is important, if you like that as a single answer. <laughs> Fair enough. I promise you I didn't personally ask it. Um, okay, moving on to uh, work in number three. And um, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a great topic, so we'll crack straight into it, but um, it's what do gender differences or assumptions mean for brain owners? And I think especially we want to focus on the impact of mental health on this one. So obviously, I know you're, you're going to say that the differences are limited if there are any, but um, you know, that being said, there are, of course, numerous differences between our genders on the surface. So what does that potentially mean for us? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, th I think it's a very important question. And actually, it's a question which, um, I mean, you're not neuroscience's finest hour if you delve into some of the rather um, unkind things that have been levelled against, you know, the, the spats that go on between neuroscience about sex differences or not. Um, one of the observations made is that there are clear gender differences in, in mental illness. So much higher incidence of depression in women, of eating disorders, self-harm, um, higher incidence of, of suicide in, in young men, um, uh, addiction um, and aggression re related problems. So at that level, yes, there are clear, there is clear gender gaps that we need to explain. And, and certainly with respect to depression and eating disorders, for example, this has been tied quite firmly to biology, saying that for some reason, uh, there are uh, gene, uh, genetic reasons for women being more prone to depression or eating disorders than men. So it almost back to the, you know, blame the brain type mantra. Um, I think with respect to that, and, and again, again, sorry, I should have said it also comes to the idea that autism is a male problem, which we've already slightly queried, uh, and things like ADHD, um, I'm not saying it's a mental health problem, but things like stuttering, for example, more common in, in boys. So brain brain related problems um, do have gender differences, but again, overlapping. Um, but explaining those, we also need to look at the context uh, because it comes back, if you like, to the idea about, you know, we raise our boys to be brave and our girls to be perfect. And the fact that men have problem with emotional expression and, and that women have a lot of problem with self-image um, and lack of self-esteem. And we know that self-esteem is a very powerful driver in the brain. And this is, in fact, where a lot of my other research has been in kind of rather unkindly sitting people in scanners and saying, can you remember the worst mistake you ever made and how much of it was really your fault um, and various issues like that and then saying um, let's have a look and see what happens to the brain and we know that the kind of brain changes associated with lack of self-esteem are the same brain changes associated with real pain so it demonstrates how important self-esteem is or, or how much importance our brain attaches if you like to maintaining our self-esteem in that it will flag up the same danger flags as, as if you're in real pain and have broken your leg, for example. Um, so I think we need to look at self-esteem. And if you're going to start looking at self-esteem, then you need to look at context in which males and females function. Is it more likely that women have lower self-esteem than men? The answer is yes. There's been worldwide surveys. Why might that be? Um, so that's not dismissing a kind of biological explanation of depression, but saying then you need to look at the context in which somebody who has this particular kind of propensity, what society, um, how society might trigger that more in one group of people than another. Um, and I talk in the book about, um, again, the, the area of the brain that I've been working on, um, which is like a go, no go system. So there's parts of our brain which will inhibit behavior if the brain predicts that these will lead to negative consequences. Um, and so there's a, a, you know, if for example, a female is confronted with a culture in which she's clearly um, not welcome, there's no people like her, it's been really difficult to get into it. Um, her successes are, uh, are not acknowledged or, or acknowledged differently from successes of uh, men. Um, then there could be something going on in the brain saying this is this is actually you know your social brain is saying 
this is actually not somewhere where you belong and the sense of belonging is, is, is really powerful. I mean, other than the, the obvious ones you've just mentioned, do you think there are some clear risks or areas that men and women should be particularly concerned of regarding uh, their gender or their perspective on their gender and how it can impact their mental health? Sorry. Okay. And again, I mean, um, being, a, being aware of that, this is where we talk about sex and gender being very much entangled to the extent that we probably shouldn't really be trying to talk about them separately. I think with respect to self-image and body image, um, still uh, eating disorders um, and uh, uh, body dysmorphia of various kinds, much much more common in females and where that might come from. And uh, understanding that this could be a very powerfully driven need from your brain um, could help um, people understand the difficulties that they have if they're struggling with those kind of problems. Um, the thing about perfection, the perils of perfectionism, um, I give talk to uh, girls in, in schools, um, generally teachers say, I've got this amazing bunch of girls who are just going to do brilliantly in science, but they're going to give it up because they can. And, you know, they science isn't for girls kind of thing. Um, and one of the reasons um, that they say, you know, I, why don't you want to do science? Science is hard. And what do you mean by that? What it really means is that science is um, something that they can get wrong. And girls, are, you know, their, their self-identity is very much tied up with, I'm, I'm somebody who always hands in my work on time. It's always neat. It's generally right. And uh, so I don't want to do something where things go wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, I can make mistakes and not understanding that that's that's really what science is about. So that's a very specific example. And do you think men and women are more prone to certain men mental health diseases? You know, you've just busted the myth on um, or like, certainly saying that uh, it's not as clear cut with autism. Um, what do you think on other, on other ones? And do you think that there are any that are? Uh, are there any that are exclusively uh, aligned with one gender or the other? Um, well, um, I mean, so a few I've questions in that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I mentioned depression um, and, and eating disorders. And if you look at the statistics, really, it, it, there's predominantly a female problem. It's the explanation that we give for that. We, we, we need to understand. So clearly, for whatever reason, women are more likely to suffer from depression or eating disorders. There are uh, two other sort of brain-based uh, gender gaps which are relevant, and that is that um, women are much more likely to suffer from Alzheimer's and men are much more likely to suffer from Parkinson's disease. Um, and understanding that and how much that is tied to the sex of the owner of the brain who has Alzheimer's or, or Parkinson's is, is, is important. I mean, are there any inklings currently or schools of thoughts in, in science that you can share with us? I mean, I appreciate if it was scientific fact, that would be quite different. But what's the current thinking behind how that's possible with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's? Um, well, Parkinson's, interestingly, in terms of the kind of social context, one of the um, risk factors which is being explored is the fact that maybe uh, the higher incidence of Parkinson's in men is due to gendered occupations they're much more likely to have been exposed to toxins or to have played sports, which have led to, uh, at the time, subclinical brain injury, which has sub subsequently emerged. So it's, it's, it, 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 that's quite a nice example of, you know, it's not because you've got an XY genotype that you've got Parkinson's, it's because you've played the kind of sports which is likely to lead to head injury. I think those two are entangled. Um, Alzheimer's may be related to evidence that women have a much more powerful immune response. Um, so people are starting to look at Alzheimer's in terms of not just, or, or, I mean, what, what actually happens is that the brain is being attacked, if you like. Why is it being attacked? How is it being attacked? And is this in, in any way related to the fact that women, uh, again, a sex difference, but overlapping, appear to have more powerful immune responses, as we've seen in recent COVID-19 statistics, for example. Okay, and then just um, starting to wrap up now um, on the basis we've, all, again, got lots of questions coming in, so I need to be a bit more uh, selective. Um, obviously, you're very big on busting the gendered brain myth. What other brain myths do you want to share to dispel? We've done right-left brain. Any others that you think uh, about sharing okay. with people? Um, oh, the, well, the old 10%, we only use 10% of our brain. Um, that's definitely a myth. Um, bigger brains are better brains, um, you know, 
uh, in this area, as in so many, the size matters issue is <laughs> is something which is is still a, a point of contention. Um, I, I think those those are the, the key things um, which which, but I, I think people have become more aware of them. Um, and what are your what are your top three fascinating discoveries that you've learned over your time about our brains and our mental health in in your work as uh, you know obviously previously the head of neuroimaging? Oh gosh. Um, just summarise a lifetime of work into three points. Case, yeah, case studies. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the work of people like Oliver Sacks, for example, um, it is amazing what individuals do with their brains or what individual brains make people do. So there's the case studies of people with profoundly damaged, in inverted commas, uh, brains can still do uh, and that you know, now that brain imaging is becoming more common, we have discovered. Um, it's also fascinating, I mean, working in schizophrenia a long time ago now, uh, understanding how we try and make sense of the fact that the world doesn't make sense of us by trying to impose some sort of order on it. So talking to individuals with particular kinds of hallucinations, you could see how, how those hallucinations arose from the context in, in, in which they were. So not quite a brain imaging thing. Just looking at, at nerve cells, I, I love the way nerve cells work. Uh, and the fact that we can now watch that, you know, we've now got ways of, of dyeing nerve cells different colors and being able to produce dangerously subjective brain images, um, as long as we're careful about how we interpret them. Okay, so we're gonna go to some questions. Um, a question from Carlos, can mental health issues be hereditary with a propensity for depression carried through genetically in the brain? Um, it certainly looks as though um, there are genetic components in depression. That's a classic, not again, <laughs> non-answer. Um, depression is, you know, it, it's not a one gene. We know this causes depression. Um, there's certainly evidence of, of, of depressive incidences running in families. Um, and that what may be inherited is the susceptibility um, in which point, you know, then the, the context in which the individual grows and any any um, particular problems they have. So, so some people, you know, lots of people have traumatic events in early years. Not all of them will then go on to become depressed, but some do, and, and that's that's what we need to understand. So, yes, I, I I think there are genetic components. I mean, our our brain and what our brains can do, it is part of our genotype. So, yes, is the answer to that. Okay, and then um, how related is neurodiversity and gender and sex? Gosh, um, neurodiversity in the, in the autism, I, you, you don't know because somebody's asked a question. I, I don't know, but I mean, I guess, you know, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of ways to interpret neurodiversity. Yeah. Um, so. I think neurodiversity is a very interesting issue and um, there are the kind of, headlines which said uh, transgender much more common in the autistic population uh, as though you know that means something I mean it does mean something but um, how you interpret that so I think neurodiversity and uh, gender is, is very interesting because one of the things um, people talk about you know can you rear your child gender neutral etc and I think we're only only be able to get over the problems that gender is causing in society by making gender irrelevant by acknowledging the fact that you can be anything you like, um, you know, could be, I don't know how many people are watching, but they could be as many different genders as there are people watching and acknowledging that is as real is important. And of course, neurodiversity kind of does that anyway, because they're saying, I don't fit neatly into this box you call neurotypical. Um, so, you know, it, 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 they're an interesting case study sounds very um, clinical. Um, but good example of, of, of what we could do. Okay, and then um, Fixigia, I'm gonna find out how to pronounce that soon. Um, I want to know, is it true that people who are bilingual from early childhood are less likely to develop Alzheimer's? Oh gosh, um, I don't know, actually. It, that sounds amazing. Answer to that. Um, I know that people who are bilingual from birth do process language differently. Um, how that then plays out in Alzheimer's? I mean, there's certainly evidence that people who are showing evidence of cognitive decline, whether or not it's related to Alzheimer's or early stages of Alzheimer's, 
can be affected by um, cognitive exercise. And I, I, I get a bit wary because you then get these people who sell brain training apps and stuff like that, which, which are uh, uh, worrying. Um, but certainly things like learning a second language in old age has been demonstrated to be very useful. So it's possible. I don't know. I'll look it up. OK, and then our penultimate question, how much of the brain is actually in use? Can we expand this and how? <laughs> um, all of it, actually. Um, in a way, that's the trouble when you're a brain imager. You don't, people who see brain images don't realise that actually what we get is a really, really, really active system. And we have to try and find tiny little differences. So you take out all of the noise and then you show what looks like a bit of the brain lighting up. The brain is active all the time. Um, more or less active depending on what you're doing and that's what brain images are looking at um, okay so yeah <laughs> okay and we're going to save our last question for a lovely way just to end so i'm just going to wrap up and say thank you very much to you gina um actually been very excited inside the company to have you on um and been waiting patiently for this moment so thank you very much for joining us. Um, as I said at the start, we've been terrible at reminding people to subscribe to us on YouTube, but as long as you keep doing it and people keep turning up, we will keep sharing. So please do subscribe. We're going to follow up with an email covering all the key takeaways from today's session with Gina, which is going to land in your inbox tomorrow. So make sure that you uh, mark our emails safe when you get them and, uh, and, and obviously devour everything from them. Um, we're going to take a break next week for the first time all summer. Uh, don't worry, we're not getting lazy. We just think that it might be good to uh, take a little bit of space and restart again in two weeks. So we will email everyone about that. And as always, we want to finish with a neuroscientific fact that's going to help you remember what you learned and help us reach more people, which is when you read or watch something, you learn it once. And when you share it, you learn it twice, cementing and building new neural pathways. So please do go on social and share one thing that you learned today with at your heights and we will retweet and repost some of our favorite lessons so um wishing obviously everyone a lovely evening before we go our last question for you gina uh, which i think you're going to enjoy which is in your experience what is the most unique neurological condition you've encountered in your scans inspired by the man who mistook his hat a uh, wife for a hat um i have to i haven't i haven't had any of those in my own in my own scanner um, uh, I mean, I have had people who've got sort of deep brain stimulations because they've got Parkinson's disease, but I haven't seen, not personally, I know colleagues have seen people who have got no um, sensory feedback of their body. So that is a bit like one of Sachs's patients, the woman who felt like she was floating because she didn't have any feedback from the fact that she was standing on the floor or touching a surface. Um, but never in my scanner. Great. And um, I guess finally, where can people follow you on social, Gina? Um, I've got a, a Twitter, uh, which is Gina Rippon1, uh, unimaginatively. Um, and that's about it, really. That's my limit of um, social media, which generally proves to be more than enough. Yeah, I think that's plenty. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much.